Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Chapter to you, O Lord. Chapter 10 from verse 25. The parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. You have re answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself and so he asked Jesus, Who is my neighbour? And in reply Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of all his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. And so too, a Levite, when he came to the place where he saw him, he passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him. I will return. I will reimburse you with any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O God. Our second reading for the day is taken from the book of Colossians, chapter 1 and verses 1 to 14. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to all the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, just as in all the world also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, if I asked you to recommend a book of the Bible for some to read if they wanted to find out about Jesus, what would you suggest? I've got some notes, but actually, what, what would you suggest? Matthew? One of the Gospels, yeah. And I think the straightforward answer is one of the Gospels. The book's written to tell us about Jesus' life and ministry and teaching. 
And if the reader was starting from scratch, I think, yeah, that's, that's probably why I'd go as well. I might point them towards Mark, which is the shortest and most immediate of the Gospels, if they wanted the least amount of reading, but to get the story. Luke, where our Gospel reading came from this morning, is longer, but he captures some important stories, like the Good Samaritan, which don't come up in the others, and is probably my favourite as a general starting point. John is the most distinct. He, he soars like an eagle, and I might choose him instead for someone who relishes his language and patterns. And that's not to say I discount Matthew entirely. Um, I'm still reading and rereading and benefiting from all four Gospels and how their witnesses work together to give us a rich picture because each one gives us a slight different perspective and together through that we see Jesus in four dimensions. But back to my original question of what you might suggest to someone in the Bible, to read in the Bible to find out about Jesus. You could go for the smarty pants answer and say any of them which technically is correct, but also I think is fairly useless and not incredibly helpful. You might focus on Isaiah, which is particularly full of prophecies that point to Jesus. And I couldn't say that you're wrong, but unless you have a particular insight about the person in mind, because some things suit certain people, I don't think I'd start somebody there. Just like somebody says, I want to read the Bible, I probably wouldn't recommend that they began right at the beginning of Genesis and work through. You can do that and I've done it and it's brilliant, but not as a beginning point. But if I rephrase the question, once someone has read two or three or all four of the Gospels, what would be a good place to continue in the New Testament to find out more about Jesus? And from, from the reading I've just done, you can guess that the answer which I have in mind is Colossians. It would be a suitable choice. The main Bible I use, this, this one with a floppy leather cover, it looks seriously Christian, doesn't it? This is a proper Bible, even got the gold around the edges and so on. It's the NASB Study Bible, and I've had it for years. When I was at university, somebody recommended it to me, and I found a, a second-hand copy, which is still moderately expensive, but it has lasted now through, yeah, about 30 years of hard use. So it's, that was a worthwhile 15 or 20 pounds I spent in the second-hand Christian bookshop. Um, and it, in the introduction to Colossians, it describes Colossians as being about the Christ of the church. And it goes on to say, Actually, I can read this directly from here. He goes on to say, uh, to, I'll read it from here because I found the exact bit. Paul's purpose is to show that Christ is preeminent, first and foremost in everything. And the Christian's life should reflect that priority. Because all believers are rooted in him and complete in him, it is utterly inconsistent for them to live life without him clothed in his love, with his peace ruling in their hearts, they are equipped to make Christ first in every area of life. Over July, we're going to have various readings from Colossians at our services, and there are a couple of more talks planned to help explore it. However, we won't manage to read every word of it together, even though it's only four chapters long. And we certainly won't draw out everything you could usefully gain from the study of it. Today it falls to me to introduce this book to you, and I do so with enthusiasm. I'm still reading and rereading this one too, and I encourage you to perhaps make July a month where you return to it and read it from end to end and meditate more deeply on some parts of this, this Jesus-filled letter. Now, I've called today's talk two good things because, well, as I read the passage through, two particular good things came to mind. And the first of those good things is the church at Colossae, which Paul writes about in glowing terms. To us, it might sound like it was an important city, but actually there's every indication that by the time Paul wrote his letter, round about 60 AD, it was on its uppers and, and in decline. I hesitate to suggest which neighbouring city or town might be like that, because I'll get in trouble. Near the end of the letter, Paul asked the Colossians to share it with their neighbours in Laodicea, and if you've ever read Revelations and the letters to the seven churches in Revelations, you will have heard of Laodicea. But he was writing in particular to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. Now most of Paul's letters are written to churches he'd either established himself or at least visited on his missionary journeys. As far as we can tell though, he never went in person to Colossae, which was instead founded by another missionary apostle called Epaphras. Does that name ring any bells? Came up in the reading. But top marks if you think of the book of Philemon, where Paul mentions Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ. We understand that the two of them were imprisoned in Rome together, 
And rather than complaining about the food or the lack of freedom, they were speaking about God's work and the churches they knew. Paul heard about the Colossians and he got excited and he wrote them a letter because of the good stuff which he'd heard from his friend Epaphras. Paul gives thanks for the Colossians because of what he's heard about their, their faith in Christ and the love which he have for all believers and because the gospel has been bearing fruit and increasing among them. Here's a challenge for us. Is that what people would say about our church? I don't want to crack the whip and command you to do more because many of us probably tend to try and do too much already and spread ourselves too thinly. I think we'd love to see the gospel bearing more fruit among, among us and more people in our community finding faith and coming in to join us. But that's, well, that's a bit outside our control, honestly. Have a think though about how you can go deeper with your faith in Christ and how you can go deeper in how you care for and love other believers. That's also partly beyond our control, but are you acting what you can do and not neglecting things which are within your grasp? So although we're reading this letter extolling the Colossians, we can look at that and think, what can we do? So at least we move a little bit towards the Colossian League. I mentioned my title was Two Good Things. If the first is the Church of Colossae and the consequent challenge to reflect what is best about them, what's the second? You might guess the answer is simply Jesus Christ. We've read a passage of 14 verses and by my counting, Jesus is mentioned seven times. Jesus Christ, Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus Christ, the Lord and God's beloved Son. Depending on which translation you're using and how you understand certain phrases, you might get a certain different number. But it's clear that Paul's thinking is deeply Christocentric. Christocentric is a bit of a technical term, but it simply means that everything is centred around and revolves around Jesus Christ. At this time of the year, you might be fortunate to have plants in your garden that are heliocentric, like sunflowers. Helios is a Greek word and it means sun. And if you watch the sunflowers throughout the day, you'll see that as they sit there looking pretty, they slowly move their heads to track the progress of the sun. They might be struggling a little bit today, but even on overcast days, they have some sense of, of where that sun is coming from. They're heliocentric, their whole life revolves around where the sun is. Well, Paul is like that with Jesus in his writing. He doesn't get through more than a sentence or two without making reference back to Jesus. Sometimes we make reference to Jesus several times in the same sentence because Paul hadn't discovered full stops. Or well, that's my ex experience as I try and read it through. It just, has a phrase and adds another phrase and adds another phrase and these are very exciting sentences but you don't know quite where to breathe and you run out of breath by the time you get to the end. But he's so excited about Jesus. It don't mean a thing if you ain't got Jesus Christ, God's beloved son and our risen Lord at the center of it all. Colossians goes on from verse 15 to tell us much, much more about Jesus. And as I said earlier, I encourage you to read the book. There's another challenge for us already though. How Christocentric is your life. How Christocentric is your thinking. When you walk around the supermarket, for example, does your mind keep coming back to Jesus? Or is it the case that when you sit in church and the speaker goes on a bit, your mind starts drifting to what you're going to have for lunch? I'm being a little bit provocative. I hope nobody's tummy is rumbling just yet, but do you understand that I'm saying this to myself as well as to you? It's to us. If you had to boil the Bible down to one essential message, it might just be that. Set your mind on Jesus. Set your heart on Jesus. Live your life choosing to abide in Jesus. Jesus was lifted up on the cross to die, to pay the price for our sin, the sin that separates us from God. Jesus was lifted up in resurrection glory so that we might look at him and have life. Let me pray. Lord, we want to be a good thing, a church that demonstrates your love and grace. Thank you for giving us the best thing, your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. So let us now affirm our faith together. We believe in one God, 
the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, and for us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's pray together. When I say, Lord, we call to you, please can you respond, hear us and answer us. Lord, we call to you, hear us and answer us. Glory be to you, God, our Father Almighty, who raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. Glory be to him who will raise us up and bring us into the fullness of his kingdom. Father, we give you our lives today, that you may take us and transform us through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We give you thanks for all who have remained faithful to you, for all who have been seen beyond the temporary to the eternal, for saints and martyrs who have been our inspiration. We pray for the persecuted church, for all Christians afflicted or tortured for their faith. Lord, we pray be strength to all who are losing hope. Be strength to the faint-hearted and the fearful. Lord, we call to you, hear us and answer us. God of peace, we pray for countries broken by war, for people facing ethnic violence and hatred, for all those discriminated against, for those being robbed of their homes, their lands and their livelihoods. Lord, we just bring before you Ukraine. Lord, we thank you for the faithful ministers who have stayed for those soldiers who are fighting. Father, we pray that you would give them your peace and bring an end to this war. And we pray, Lord, that you would open the eyes of the Russian people to what their president is doing. We pray, Father, for Afghanistan and for those who remain there. Lord, we call to you, hear us and answer us. We give thanks for those who have protected us, for those who have shielded us from harm <clears throat> or evil, who have enriched our lives by their goodness. We commit to you the police and the fire service, the ambulance service, and all those who give their lives to serve. 
and for all upon whom our security depends. Lord, we call to you, hear us and help, help us. We pray for areas where lives are wasting away, for the poor, the homeless and the refugee, for all who suffer from mental illness, the disturbed and the violent, and for all who have lost the will to live, for those on the edge, for those suicidal. Lord, we call to you, hear us and help us. We pray for, pray for those places recently where there have been shootings, where people have died at the hands of another. Particularly, we pray for Chicago and the Netherlands. We pray for those families who have lost loved ones. Lord, we call to you, hear us and help us. Lord, extend our vision. May we look beyond what we see to the eternal. We pray for all who see you in that glory, which is beyond measure. And we remember the families of loved ones departed, particularly praying for Neil Healy's family and Anne Wood's family and any other known to us. Lord, we call to you, hear us and answer us. And the collect for the fourth Sunday after Trinity. Gracious Father, by the obedience of Jesus, you brought salvation to our wayward world. Draw us into harmony with your will, that we may find all things restored in him, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. 